just just start out asking about Henry Lee Lucas, and if we get off on a tangent, that's fine. But we'll just use that as a starting point to talk about his involvement in cults and how widespread it is, and, and, and the hand of death in particular. How how did you first um, get involved with um, with the Henry Lee Lucas case? Just was him. I read all the news stories that were going on over a period of months about this man who was crazy enough to admit that he killed an awful lot of people. And I, I followed his trial when he was convicted of murdering his child bride, Becky, in the newspapers. But I kind of, it was just in the back of my mind. I was aware of it, that's all. And then after he'd been transferred down to, uh, to Georgetown, and it's being held in jail down there and being tried for the Orange Sox murder. I got a phone call one night from a member of this, this parish here, the Church of the Resurrection, from a lady who's the wife of a professor at SMU. And she asked me if I'd be interested in writing the life story of Henry V. Lucas. And I said, well, uh, not really, and she said, I, I, I asked her why. And she said, well, her sister was ministering to him in, while he was in jail in, in Georgetown. And she, Henry wants to tell his story and wants to get it out where people will see it and will get the whole story because the authorities aren't allowing it out. Well, that quickened my interest, but I said, well, uh, let me think about it. She said, are you going to be home for the next 15 minutes? And I said, yes. Well, I'll have my sister call you. And while I was waiting for our sister Clemmy to call me, I had talked it over with my wife, and, and Myrnie says, well, I think you ought to hear her out and see what she says. So when Sister Clemmy called, she explained that Henry had met the Lord, Jesus, in his cell, up in Stoneburg, in the, in the jail up there. And that he had been told, he promised the Lord that he would confess, he would, he would identify all the people he'd murdered. And he wants the whole story out. And Clemmy talked to me, and, and she convinced me that I should drive down to Georgetown and meet Henry and hear what Henry had to say. So the following weekend, Murray and my life, Bernie and I drove down to Georgetown, and I met Henry. And that's how I got involved. So when I heard Henry's story, how he described how Jesus had, had appeared to him in that jail cell, I decided, well, let me, let's, let's hear the whole thing. So over a period of a year, and putting together some 40 to 60 hours of taped conversation with Henry, I pulled together the story that's in the book. And, and you were convinced that his conversion to Christianity was, was legitimate? Yes. Okay. And your book is, is based entirely on the interviews with Henry? Was there any outside support from anybody of the cult or any other uh, news accounts that Led to that, or no, there was, was one. It, has was anyone else in the cult ever been caught, or did it come oh, to yes. lie? Yes, others have been caught. They what? They have not identified the hand of death. Huh? They've done everything but that. And I think the reason is that Henry identified it, and as a result of, it, of them knowing he was making this identification, they tried to kill him three times while he was incarcerated, and failed. It failed primarily because uh, the sheriff kept him isolated in a double cell. He couldn't be reached. Um, and every place he went, a Texas Ranger went with him. And they were armed. And I mean every place he went. So they simply couldn't get to him to kill him. They tried three times. How, how did he find out that they had tried? Well, they tried, number one, to poison him, and it didn't work, because he was having stomach trouble and didn't eat that food that night. And 
access to plenty, had to bring in food from the outside because they couldn't get the food that the stomach would accept in the jail. They didn't know that. They tried to shoot him because his cell was faced on the, on the front of, on the side of the jail in Georgetown, and there was a window across a very narrow aisle. There was a window that let sunlight into his cell. They shot through the window. And they had a man who was arrested and incarcerated there until pending trial in the Georgetown jail. And he tried to, when he was given exercise time, he tried to get to Henry to kill him. He couldn't. So he had himself incarcerated just so he could yeah. get um, So Henry, Henry tried all this. And they tried all this on, on Henry, but and I think that's why these a lot of these people who are who are involved in it won't identify it. Because I feel that the hand is still a viable, ongoing organization. And it's a, a satanic religion. It's a church. Well, from what information Henry gave you or any kind of outside verification, do you know, like, can you pinpoint, like, any kind of headquarters or any kind of... Uh... Henry identified where the training camp was. Right, that's in the book. That's, and that was in the Everglades, with Florida. He notified the FBI of it. The FBI did an overfly and flew over the area looking for the signs of the camp. Henry told them why they, they, wouldn't, they couldn't spot it from the air. <coughs> but they would not go into the Everglades in the airboats and find it. They wouldn't take the time to do it. I personally think that they did, and they found traces of where the camp had been, but it, it had been moved, because it was a portable camp. And I think they found traces of where the camp had been, but it had been moved. And for various reasons which I'll never understand, they didn't want to admit that such an organization existed. Now, this was the authorities. Henry told me that they, they had explained to him that he should not say anything about the hand of death because it would create riots among the people. To know that there were 2,000 adherents to this religion walking the streets of the country, killing at will. You have to understand that in the satanic church, <coughs> pardon me, when you become a, a satanist, you admit that you're already dead. As far as the world is concerned, you're already dead. They cannot do anything to you. Therefore, you can do whatever you want. If they kill you, all they're doing is, is taking nothing. Because you're already dead. And it takes that kind of faith to believe that in order to do the things that they demand you do. Well, faith is, is a very funny thing. It takes precisely the same amount of faith to believe something, for instance, to believe in, in Jesus, as it would to believe in Satan. It takes the same measure of faith. It takes the same measure of faith to be an agnostic as it does to be a priest. It takes the same measure of faith to be a witch as it does to be a nun. You know, faith is, is constant. We have to believe in something before we can be it. And if you believe there's no God, that's your faith. That's your religion. Yes. Okay, beyond the FBI's initial investigation of, of the camp in Florida, to your knowledge, has there been any other follow-up investigation of the cult? And, and along those lines, why do you think that you know the authorities have haven't pursued it as much as maybe they should have? And and, and why didn't more come out in the paper about it? And, and why did Jim Maddox have Henry recant his confession? Um, Henry told them, you know, about the ranch in Mexico. He gave them a map showing the location. He told them who was in charge of it. He told them what they did there. 
he described it to, to fine detail. To my knowledge, it was never investigated. It was never investigated. Well, number one, it was in another country. <coughs> the State Department would have had to have been involved. Um, some of the confessions that Henry made involved Canadian people he killed, Spanish people he killed, Mexicans he killed, um, assassinations that he had done on orders from the hand. This also involved the State Department, would make waves that they didn't need and didn't want, didn't want to acknowledge. So it was much easier to, to, say, that, to say that Henry was creating a story to create sympathy for himself and, and a reason for the vile things he did that had no basis. And all the time it did, it had a very strong basis. And now he's going down to Florida to face, uh, face trial for two additional murders with, with his, his homosexual partner, Otis Toole. I understand that, that Otis, what I was led to believe Otis was just on that show to reporters, and it seemed like they had given Otis a new set of teeth and they had taken away his death sentence in order to get his testimony against him. Yeah. It's going to be Otis and Becky's little brother testifying. And, and, you know, that, that's, that's, that's interesting because our noble attorney general here in Texas told Henry at the time he recranted all of his confessions in Waco that he was going to walk on all charges except perjury and that that would be reduced to time. So he'd walk a free man if he just recanted everything. Now, obviously, I think that Maddox did that as a smokescreen to cover and to to get publicity to drown out the coming investigation of the Waco District Attorney. Vic Pazell. Yeah, Vic Pazell, for malfeasance in office. The whole thing was a stage show. So because they, they, they would let someone that had killed hundreds of people go free just for their political... They wouldn't let him go free. They lied to him. Oh, right. Okay. They told him that he would, if he would just recant, with no intention of ever going in and... and and retrying him on the eight convictions he already had. They simply wanted to discredit him. Now think about this. The hand hadn't been able to kill him and silence him. He was talking. He had to be shut up one way or another, and one way to shut someone up when they're talking is to discredit them so no one will listen and believe. Jim Maddox and Vic Vazell did that very efficiently. They did what the hand couldn't do. Now you can take the inference that you, any inference you want from that. They did what the hand couldn't do. So Henry recanted. I spent an hour with Henry just the day before he was sent to Huntsville to death row. And Henry told me then, that's when Henry told me that Maddox had promised him he'd walk. On all charges, all convictions. <coughs> and then he told me a very interesting story about the murder of Becky, the murder of Becky. When I, in our interviews, when I asked Henry, Henry described the murder, how he killed her. <coughs> and I said, well, Henry, when you went back to the church camp, what did you tell the people there? Why Becky wasn't around anymore? Henry says, I can't remember what I told them. I was high on cocaine at the time, and I can't remember what I told him. I said, well, we've got to tell him something. Because when you went back, Becky's Uncle Otis was there, and he asked about her. What did you tell him? Well, I told him I'd murdered her. Well, what did you tell the people at the church camp who knew Becky and liked her and had converted her to Christianity? What did you tell them? He said, I, I can't remember. And I said, well, let's do this. We need to put some reason, some excuse in the book. I will put it this way, that you went back and told them that Becky had run off, that she had, you'd had an argument about going to Florida, which you did have, and you told her that, that you weren't going to stay in air-conditioned motels on the way to Florida because you couldn't afford it, 
she decided she'd go to Florida on her own, and she le she left and got a ride with a truck driver and went to Florida. That's the story I've heard. And so Henry says, "Yeah, that's that's that, I think that's what I did tell him." And I said, "All right, that's what we'll put in the book." Now, when Maddox told Henry to recant and he'd walk on everything, <coughs> Maddox got him a new attorney and everything else to defend him and to carry this out. And this attorney then informed him that they had found the truck driver that Becky left with to go to Florida. And that Becky was still alive. And this truck driver would come into court and testify that he took Becky away. And therefore, you couldn't have killed Becky. That'll remove that conviction. So I asked Henry, I said, hold on a minute. Do you mean after the entire world knows you killed Becky, that she couldn't pick up a phone someplace and phone and say to the district attorney, hey, I'm Becky. Henry didn't kill me. Why wouldn't she do that, Henry? I don't know. I said, yes, you do. You know why. Because you murdered her, and her uncle cut her up and scattered the parts in that field. That's why. And he looked down at the floor, and he wouldn't look at me after that. He wouldn't look at me from that point on. And do you think it's like he's been quoted as saying that that, that was the death that bothered him the most? It was Becky. Yeah. That was the only one he loved that he killed. The fact, you know, see, I sent a copy of this book as a gift to Jim Maddox when the thing started to, to boil. Mm -hmm. Maddox read the book. He saw the excuse Henry used with Becky. Not knowing that you would... Not knowing it was, it was like something I had, I had made up for him to use as an excuse. And then he went to, to Henry and says, we found the truck driver. But he never is, left with a truck driver. Is, is Henry too simple-minded to, to not be able to, can, has he forgotten what he's told who? Yeah, Henry only has a fourth-rate education. And that's another point. The only murders that I mentioned in the book are the ones he could clearly remember. Because his mind was so fogged over with the use of drugs that his memory could not be dependent upon. And if he couldn't remember it, and remember the details and how it was done, I didn't include it in the book. Henry admits that he killed 175 women while participating in 360 murders with us. Now, the trigger to his memory was if he was taken to the location, then he could tell them where to look. That was, that's what triggered his memory. And you have to go back to what Henry, the deal Henry made when he saw Jesus in his cell in Stoneberg. He saw this light appear in his cell at night. And he was freezing because they'd run the air conditioner down to where where he couldn't stand it hardly. Right. And he was freezing in that cell and he saw this light and he felt warm. <coughs> he knew who it was because he called that light the Lord. And the Lord said, I want you to give up the bodies of all the people you killed. Remember, this is a fourth grade education telling me this. Give up all the bodies of the people you killed to help me, the light, answer their prayers. Yes, Lord. But I can't remember all of them. The light then says, I will help you remember. Now let's say that a police officer who came down from Canada to question Henry about a murder that Henry had remembered in Canada. And the police officer would, would give him 
in, in trying to identify the area or something, the police officer might accidentally or inadvertently give him some details that would lead him to say, oh yes, it happened there on that date. Henry thought that was the way the Lord was helping him remember. He wasn't admitting anything just for the sake of admitting, but he did promise he would give them all up. He promised God he would give them all up, and he didn't want to miss any. So yes, he did admit to some he didn't do. That's in the book. He did admit to some he didn't do, because he, he couldn't remember, his mind was so fogged with drug, with habitual drug use while all these things were happening, that he simply couldn't remember, but he didn't want to miss any. He promised God he'd get them all. So if some, someone dropped a hint to him, he seized on it. He thought that was God's way of giving him the information to remind him. Well, for the first time, you know, a lot of things are kind of falling together and making sense. Now, there, there one murder that, that uh, he, was, uh, he, he gave him the graphic details of everything and was a murder in Houston. He gave them the graphic details of how she was murdered, what was taken from the house, everything. And the date. The date was firmly established. That was a matter of police records. And after Henry confessed and they thought they really had the guy because he told them things that nobody could know except the murderer, they discovered Henry was in prison in Michigan when it happened. Couldn't possibly have done it. That nobody can explain. But he gave him all the details. So um, he may have heard it from someone when he was drunk. And that may have triggered, you know, he may have that in his memory. It could have been another member of the hand of death. Yeah. Now, there's also a big thing about how could he commit all these murders at various places. These people talked when they met. There's a, there's a lot of interchange of information, you know, about. Uh, I did this, and I did, well, I did, while you were doing that, I did this, and, and uh, in, that, in that drug frame of mind, a lot of those things stayed in that, in that poor brain of Henry's. Yet, they, they say that he couldn't possibly go from here to here, or there to there, in the time that was allowed. Uh, I, I know that Henry, because at, at the Hand of Death camp in the Everglades, they trained him to rob banks, they trained him to rob stores, to raid houses, for whatever money he needed to serve Satan. Money was no problem. He could get money whenever he needed it. He'd just rob a store. And they told him, don't leave a witness alive. Don't leave anybody can testify against you. So when he robbed the store, he killed the, the clerk and whoever else was in the store, or he could possibly witness it. And he took great, great pride in the fact that he killed them all. Now when, when Henry, here's, here's a man with a fourth grade education who has never been in a church service, a formal church service in his life, except at that religious camp, and he couldn't stay in those services. He had to get up and leave in Stoneburg. Uh, that's the only time he'd ever gone. He only went there three times. But here's a man with a fourth grade education, can hardly read and write. And when he described the, the Hand of Satan religious ceremonies that took place in the Everglades, he described in perfect detail all of the elements of a traditional satanic black mass, which follows basically, except everything is reversed, which follows basically the typical Roman Catholic or Anglican Mass in the Christian religion. Uh, this, for a man with Henry's education, he couldn't possibly have done it. To do it so accurately and explain it so well and describe it in such detail. When they prepared the host in a black mass, <coughs> particularly when a human sacrifice was used, Henry described when they put that five-year-old boy on the altar. 
and the hand, the high priest, took the dagger and held it above the boy's body. The boy was alive, drugged but alive. Brought the dagger down and cut the boy's heart out. Then held the heart up, the beating heart, still beating. Held it up in his hands and the blood ran down his arms. And held it up and says, the body of our Lord Satan. The same as an Anglican or a Catholic priest elevates the host and says, the body of our Lord. Now, a fourth grade education doesn't provide him with that kind of information. I am firmly convinced that the, what he described going on in the Everglades is the truth, it actually happened, it existed, and it probably exists someplace else now today. And that there are people like Henry walking the streets, as Henry said, there were over 2,000 of them, walking the streets, killing. But you don't look for those victims in the murder list. The victims of the hand, if you want to you want to find their names, you look in the missing list. Because the bodies are generally destroyed. They're not left laying around. Unless the man is traveling and he wants the news to get back to the hand, the master, the high priest, <coughs> that one of his servants is serving their Lord and Master. That's the way they, they continue to, to advise that they're still active. Do you think all the, the people that he stayed with up in Stonberg, you don't think there's any cult-related activity no. up there? All those people are... No, they are they're good Christian innocent. people who took them in out of Christian charity. Henry and Otis were involved. They firmly believed they couldn't be touched. They were schooled and trained for what they did. Neither one of them is smart enough to think of it by themselves. Henry has eight murder convictions in the state of Texas that have not been removed by the Attorney General. Otis has confirmed too many of Henry's murders in those eight convictions for them ever to be removed. So, all I can say is, the Hand of Death is an ongoing organization. It's currently in operation, someplace. They're training them, probably in Mexico, maybe up in the North Woods, maybe up in northern Idaho, Montana, Alaska, Hawaii. It could be any place. It's a religion that a great many people believe and act upon. Do you think that the particular people apprehended in connection with the, the Madame Morris cult were more than just marginally related to the Hand of Death? Oh yes, yes. Do you think they were? I do. Closely affiliated, if not to the Hand of Death. I really do, and I think uh, I think the the relationship is so close. When I spoke to the to to the Texas law enforcement people in Colleen a year ago about cults, after after my presentation, several of the several of the police officers who were there, and they were there from all over the state of Texas, uh, came up to me afterwards, and every one of them confirmed the fact that they saw the marks of the hand, the hand of death, the organization that I had described in my presentation, they saw it evidenced in a great many murders that were still on their books all over the state. Does the hand of death have a trademark? Yeah. They always leave the, a mark on the victim. Henry marked the victims. Does it go on that in this book? Yeah, it's in the book. Henry Mark marked every victim. Uh, that mark was never the same. But they always leave a clue, a clue that nobody can, can use. 
And that's the clue, that's, that's the mark of the hand. Like Henry would cut a cross on a breast, or on the cheeks of the fanny, or on the stomach. Or maybe he would nip the lobe off of an ear. In that one murder where he left the, the book of matches in the hand of the, the woman he killed in the motel, and the book of matches was to a, a motel in Oklahoma City, that was, that was the marking left on her. So it's never the same. The school teacher he killed when he was headed down to Florida, uh, I think if I remember right, he, he, he cut a cross on her breast. Uh, Henry had sexual intercourse with women. If they objected, if they, if they submitted and allowed him to do what he pleased with them while he was still alive, he killed them after he did it. But if they objected to it, he killed them and then did it. Um, so they, <coughs> he, he was, I think Henry was bisexual. I know he had homosexual relations with Otis. <coughs> he was very reluctant to have, have sexual relations with Becky, but he did. And he did have sexual relations with a lot of his victims. A lot of them he didn't even touch, other than to kill them. Well, um, I, I think that when, when Henry's moved to Florida, that there, there might be a lot of renewed interest in, in this case. And it's kind of <coughs> died out, as far as I can tell. Yes. Just, just because... How many times can a man be convicted? Yeah, and plus the, the confusion just doesn't lend itself to 30-second yeah. sound bites on TV. But, but they have made a motion picture about Henry. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, I haven't. No, but there, there's a write-up about it. And I think the current Rolling Stone is on the stands right now. I'll have to give it. I don't have a copy. I was, I looked, someone told me about it at school, and I looked at it in 7-Eleven. I looked at it <laughs> well, I don't think I would either. <laughs> but, but it's, it's um, they don't they don't use his last name, but the name of the movie is Henry. So, I don't know, maybe that, that maybe that's good news to your publisher if, if he still has these. Yeah. I don't I don't know if it in any way is, is based on, on, on Well your the book account. is still in print and it can be obtained from the publisher. Somebody to Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the the publisher that uh, in, the publisher that did the Hand of Death is a branch of Huntington House, right, which is a religious, yeah, which is a Christian. Publisher. Did you ever do a secular, I mean, a, a non secular version of this book? Uh, no, no, no. We were planning to, but when when Henry went through the recanting, the bookstores lost interest in Henry. But everything he told me in there is true. Unfortunately, the DA in Waco and the Attorney General destroyed his credibility. There's still a lot of murders that are marked solved because of Henry's convictions, confessions. Uh, they just won't prosecute on them, but they cleared the cases. <coughs> <coughs> because he could tell them. He says, if you will go to such and such a place and dig up, you'll find a body with the hand in the mouth. That's the way he marked that body. They would go to that location and dig, and they would find the body with the hand in the mouth, where he buried it. Now, that was a murder he committed. He might send them, uh, he, might, he might say, you, you drive down a street in such and such a town, and when you come to a yellow house, with a green door, I murdered the woman in the upstairs bedroom there. Well, the house now is, is maybe white, and the green door is now maybe yellow. But when they find that it once was painted the way he described, or they go to the murder records and they find, yes, a body was up there, that murder is solved. Henry killed him. 
Now, how many times do they have to go to court and spend millions of dollars to convict a man who's been already convicted? <coughs> Randy, is there a plug for this because it's starting to flash battery? Uh, well, do you have a backup battery? Yeah, we, we could, but I think we've got it. Okay, all right. Probably plenty.